Second paper is, is a Smeester's paper. And again, we're just going to look at a different statistic, but we're going to look for two little variants, the same kind of idea. This is a different social psychology experiment. The conventional wisdom in social psychology is certain colors evoke certain moods or states of mind that then produce certain behaviors. So the idea is the color red makes people break with the rules. Blue makes them sort of acquiesce. And the color white means they kind of follow the rules when they're supposed to, and they kind of deviate when they're supposed to. That was my understanding from reading the article. But certain colors evoke certain things. So they basically had subjects um, answer questions that were very closely linked to stereotypical attributes of certain types of people, by gender, by demographics, etc. But they handed them the instructions before they filled in this survey in different colored folders. And the idea is if you hand someone a red folder, they're going to tend to break with the stereotypes. And with blue, they're going to go along with them and, and whatnot. So it turns out there were um, these three different color conditions and then four different types of tests. There's 12 arms. There's three colors. There's four outcomes. The theory predicts for six of them, you're going to answer a lot of the 20 questions you're asked in the affirmative. And for six of those 12, you're going to answer fewer of them in the affirmative. Because the color is going to push you towards the affirmative, let's say, if you get, re you know, if you get blue, but it's going to push you away from answering yes if you get red. So that's the prediction. 12 arms, six predicted high, six predicted low. OK, so we have the six low predicted arms on the left, the six high predicted arms on the right. This is yes answers out of 20 questions. And the thing that caught Simonson's eye here is all the low predicted arms have almost exactly the same mean. They're nine point something. And almost all the high predicted arms have almost the exact same mean between 11.4 and 12 out of 20. Now, these were actually somewhat different questions. There were some about sort of gender stereotypes. You know, there was a picture of Albert Einstein in one of them, if you remember the article. Like, you know, why those treatments would generate exactly the same response, even if they're predicted to have the same sign. You know, like, we, you know, sometimes we test. This is a little bit of the obsession, you know, in a lot of the social sciences with rejecting the null. So, OK, some sort of predict you'd have a positive effect. Some predict you'd have a negative effect. But as far as I can tell in the description of this paper, none of them make very clear predictions about the exact magnitude of the effect. But somehow, they have exactly the same impact. It just seems totally bizarre. So it's just 12 out of 12, exactly. Nailed it. You know, It's like you just keep hitting shots from midcourt as a basketball analogy. You just hit 12 in a row every time. It's just not going to happen. OK, so this, is, this was the concern. How likely is it, given a certain distribution, given that the outcome, let's say, is normally distributed with a certain mean and standard deviation, how likely is it that those six means are going to be that close together? Same thing for the high conditions. So again, it's the same kind of idea. He's going to use the summary statistics in the article himself. He's actually going to impose the same distribution for all the lows. And then a separate same distribution for all the highs. He's rigging the data to look more similar than it probably is. Okay? And despite rigging the data as much as possible, when he takes his 100,000 draws of a normal with those characteristics, he finds it just incredibly unlikely you would get this pattern. 0. 0.00021. So this is 21 out of 100,000 cases again. This wasn't even, wasn't even close. Um, and this is the kind of equivalent plot. What's the likelihood that the average difference in means is this similar? Way out in the tail. It's just so implausible, the patterns that were documented, that they were generated by any, by any real data that basically the ethics committee at Erasmus University concluded he must have committed fraud. The other thing with, in all these cases is there was this pattern. It came out in the Staple case. It comes out in this case that the, the accused 
wouldn't share their data with other people. They wouldn't share their data with their research assistants. They wouldn't sort of share their data with their co-authors. And that's sort of like a common problem or pattern. So I think the bottom line is it's just hard to fake data and make it look real. Maybe people could do better than these folks. But there's just a lot of statistics you'd have to fake. So here's another one you'd have to fake to get it right. Another Smeester study was a willingness to pay study, something that economists love and people in other fields. And this is willingness to pay for different types of t-shirts. But it turns out when you ask people for willingness to pay data, they bunch up on multiples of five. And that's just like everybody knows. Like anybody who's looked at real world willingness to pay data or valuation data sees these kinds of patterns. You know, in, in low income countries where, where a number of us in the room collect data, ages are also clumped at five. Like if you ask old folks in rural Malawi their age, there's going to be a lot of 50s and a lot of 60s and not very many 67 and a half. So there's going to be this bunching. And in fact, so he plots this data out again. There's Smeesters again. You know, in one of these studies, exactly 20% of observations were multiples of five. In every other real world study, it's 80% or multiples of five because everybody goes, oh, I'll pay you five bucks. I'll pay you 10 bucks for it. In another one, Smeesters got a little wise and it was, you know, 25% or something like that. But it's like yet another dimension of the data that just is like a complete outlier. So anyway, I don't even know how much time Simonson spent on paper after paper getting the code, creating these figures. Because um, he also writes his own papers, as we've seen. But he did a real service for the field of social psychology in just documenting how pervasive these problems were that basically well-established faculty in multiple countries, you know, scholars, were almost certainly making up their, their studies. OK, so what does Simonson say next? He, he provides some advice. Before you jump into this, be really sure. Get a lot of data. Get a lot of evidence from multiple studies before you even raise this. And that's actually good advice because you know, this ended the career of, of prominent scholars. And so if, you, if someone were to raise concerns based on um, sort of spurious evidence and sort of you know, ruin the career of someone who didn't commit fraud, then that would obviously be very costly. Um, he also you know, contacted the authors and asked them for data and was very transparent about his concerns and, and whatnot. Um, and then th this is probably the most important point. The last one is if you do have evidence along these lines, approach the relevant authorities, investigative authorities in their institution. Like, don't go to the media. Don't go to bloggers. Like, there is actually a mechanism. In, you know, academic institutions and research institutions have mechanisms for dealing with this. 